Right now you're hearing music from my brand new Ableton Live pack called Dream Organ. Dream Organ is a collection of lush, dreamy, spacious sounds created from samples of the Yamaha PS20 organ synth. The Yamaha PS20 is very popular in the dream pop genre and was made famous by the band Beach House. It's featured on a lot of their music. It's got some really cool warm sounds, kind of toyish at times. But when we put it into Ableton Live Racks, when we put some effects on it, arpeggiators, and start manipulating the sounds, we get a lot of really interesting and diverse sounds that can be used in any style of music. I've created instrument racks that accurately recreate the sound of the Yamaha PS20, and I've also taken those sounds and combined it with the power of Ableton Live to create stuff impossible with the original hardware and useful in all kinds of music. So check out the Dream Organ Ableton Live Pack. It's available at my store at brianfunk.com. And if you're a member of the Music Production Club, you will get this during the month of July 2022. And if it's not July 2022 anymore, don't worry. There's always something new and exciting for the Music Production Club. You can learn more about Dream Organ by going to brianfunk.com slash dream dash organ. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Music Production Podcast. I'm your host, Brian Funk, and this is the show about all things making music. And on today's show, I have Robot Kosh, who is a musician, producer. He's just released his new album called The Next Billion Years, which is a really cool kind of ambient orchestra-based um, piece of music that has a lot of philosophical concepts to it, a lot about like emotional impact and the the themes of our species and where we're going and where we are now. It's it's really a beautiful collection of music. And I'm very excited to have him here. He also does a lot of TV and film scoring. He's done music for NBC's The Blacklist, the MTV Teen Wolf series, and Netflix's You, which my wife was watching for a little while there. So <laughs> I was absorbing your music even though I wasn't aware at the time. So Robot, it's great to have you here. Thanks for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. Pleasure to be here. Yeah, it's nice to have you. It's cool to see that um, even before I we'd connected that I have actually heard your music in some of these shows. So, right, yeah, a lot of people do. You know, they're like, "Oh, I heard you on this show, on that show." It's uh, it's fun. I mean, to me, there's two things I do in this whole um, TV and, and, and film realm. There's like scoring to picture. And there's like my music that's licensed, you know. So mm. that sometimes gets mixed up because on Teen Wolf and uh, How to Get It with Mur Murder, I didn't score the show. I had like original music of mine placed on the show, right? Mm -hmm. And then there's other TV shows, um, like uh, a show from uh, Amazon Prime that I scored last uh, last year, where I did the whole music, you know, all eight episodes, like the full-on score. So I always need to differentiate that, you know, because I, I think... Um, I know one of the composers who's one of on, on one of these shows, and I don't want to mix it up, <laughs> saying like I'm the, the composer. But I'm uh, yeah, I just ha I have a lot of my music placed on TV shows um, for the last ten years, really. You know, it's like mm. the Blacklist, uh, you that show Dark on Netflix. Oh, um, I love that show. That's yeah, a great me show. too. That was like one of my favorite placements because I also loved the show, and I knew the show, and I was looking forward to season three. And then before the season three came, uh, three came out, I, I learned that one of my songs was going to be in the uh, first episode, and I was super excited about that. Mm. Yeah, that's a show that really, you know, kind of bends your mind a lot. It, I had to watch yeah. that show with like some, you know, assistance from the internet, just explaining exactly what's happening, and all the different timelines. Yeah, that it's it's complicated. It's really well written, mm -hmm. and yeah, I love it. It's just. Um, good example of of like how you can make something accessible and a little sophisticated you know because i feel like a lot of new shows that are coming out they're just so predictable like the writing is really bad you know and they're just shooting them out uh and i always say like if you haven't watched dark that's like a good example of a show that's you know fun to watch and exciting but also like really well written and mm -hmm. interesting twists and turns and yeah it's just like a, a good show 
Yeah. Yeah. I like doing a little work for it, you know, when I'm watching it. Sometimes, like you said, things are just kind of so clear and obvious and they're, they're like in the template of the particular genre and you, you can kind of spell it out before you even watch it. <laughs> sure. I mean, sometimes to just switch off your brain, these things can be fun to watch too, mm -hmm. you know, but, um, yeah, I just like a good story and I just mm -hmm. like good character development and all that. And, and just like a good mood too. Um, I mean, that's why I love the first season of Stranger Things and I'm, I'm still watching it, you know, mm. I'm not hating Me on the too. new season, but like, just like a good mood that it created, like the first one, it was like so dense and I think Dark similarly um, created such a mood and such an ambience and atmosphere, you know, which I'm really drawn into because then you're in that world and uh, then the character development is uh, well played out and the show is well written and yeah, it's a winner. Mm. I agree. Yeah, definitely take you someplace. It's not one to just sit down on the couch if you want a nice, relaxing evening. You're going to be taken for a ride, and you you better have your wits about you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's very true. A friend of mine uh, said she couldn't watch it because um, she wasn't in like a super well uh, mental health uh, state, and mm. she's like that show straight up depresses me. <laughs> mm. And I mean, I get it. You know, like if you're a little down. Uh, emotionally or whatever like these darker things can totally get to you so mm -hmm. for me not so much because um i just find solace in that kind of stuff too you know even if i feel <laughs> down like i kind of resonate with that i don't know why maybe i'm weird it, no well then i am too because there's a lot of music i like because i like being depressed to it <laughs> or i like feeling <laughs> sad like i actually enjoy the sadness of <laughs> the way the, you know um just i know the, what you mean yeah, it's not. It's comforting, I guess you know, and and yeah, and it's it's also like melancholy to me isn't just all bad, you know. It's not mm -hmm. like hopeless darkness or whatever. It's like there's this bittersweetness that I really enjoy, you know, mm -hmm. um, about things that are a little melancholic or even like a little on the dark. Because dark sometimes also just means it's something that we don't really know what it is, you know, and that mm -hmm. scares people not knowing. It's just scary in general. Yeah. And I find not knowing intriguing in general, you know, like mm -hmm. I'd rather be like, oh, what's in that dark room? You know, I'm like equally scared <laughs> and intrigued. And some people are like, oh, no, that's off limits for me. Like, I'm not going to look in there, you know, Met metaphorically speaking, too. You know, I'm like somebody who likes to look at his, uh, his own shadow, to speak, you know, rather than just like turning a blind eye and look the other way. Mm. Well, I think that's a testament to uh, your music in a way too. That it's it doesn't call for sort of the cookie cutter, you know, straight ahead, predictable type of music either. And that was something I always appreciated about that show, is it was immersive in so many ways, and the music was a huge part of that. Mm. Do you know offhand which episode you were in, so we can tell people, and I can check it out myself? Sure. Yeah, it's um, the last season, and it's the first episode. Okay. So it's, you know, how they have always these, uh, like, uh, bigger montage scenes at the end where, like, the plot sort of yeah. comes together and there's, like, one song playing. So in the first episode, that's, that's one of my songs. Oh, so that's, like, a key moment, too. Yeah, it's a good moment, for yeah. sure. So cool, man. That's awesome. How did you get yourself involved in doing scoring and licensing for TV shows? Honestly, it, it kind of found me. I can't say that I chased it. Because in the beginning, I wasn't even aware that it existed. I mean, the music licensing thing. Mm -hmm. Film scoring is something that we can maybe talk about in a minute that I always kind of aspired to, but I never really knew my way of my way around of like how to approach that. How do I get into this? I never knew. I was just like, since I was a kid, I was like a film fan and collected VHS tapes and stuff. So I always had like a knack for movies. The first soundtrack, or the first CD I ever bought was like the Star Wars soundtrack by John Williams. Mm -hmm. Um, so that was always a thing for me. And with the music licensing, I, you know, one day I just got an email like from Sony, which is my publisher, and they reached out about a license request that came in from the States. Back then I lived in Berlin still. And it was for this show, um, I think it was The Blacklist. That was in 2012. And yeah, they just wanted to license one of my songs. I was like, that's cool. I don't know what show that is, but I was like surprised that it's good money and I was like, yeah, let's do it. And then I, I learned how big of an impact it has because people start shazamming that, you know, and right. then then the song has another life on Spotify all of a sudden and on YouTube. And 
that made me realize how powerful like music placements really are also in terms of um, exposing your music to a larger audience that previously had no idea you existed, you know, apart from like the financial aspect of it being like a nice uh, chunk of money, but not so much anymore. I mean, budgets have slimmed down um, in the last 10 years, you know, mm -hmm. especially with the streamers taking over. Um, I think back in the day, if it was like network television, they had different budgets than let's say a Netflix show has nowadays for music. But aside from that, it's still great for exposure. So I'm grateful I had a really good run with uh, sync placements over the last 10 years, really. Mm. Yeah, you mentioned Stranger Things. I mean, I'm sure Kate Bush has a thing or two to say about yeah, the power well, of uh, you know, uh -huh. a placement. You know, that song but, you is know, on that's the charts beautiful again. That a song from 1985 you know, mm -hmm. can re reach the top of the charts again. like Higher than it 20... originally did. Yeah, and yeah. in 2022. So that just speaks to... Um, two things really like how timeless music is uh, and now it doesn't have a shelf life anymore mm. so that's a good thing about like streamers and all that and about the power of like placements uh, in general you know like uh, all these young kids that had no idea who Kate Bush was now are like big fans yeah. you know? so <laughs> I'm into that and it's a good song that also speaks to like a good song is a good song even like mm -hmm. 25 or 30 years later yeah yeah, a lot of things are aligning perfectly to make that happen. And it is yeah. really cool to see. And I think, like you said, and this kind of speaks to a lot of your work, I think, too, is the power of not just the music, but when you combine it with the visuals and with yeah. the film. That seems exactly. to be a big part of what you do, even with your own music. Um, from If we want to maybe kind of get into your new record a little bit, because I, I want to make sure. sure people hear about that, because it's, it's really cool work and it's got a lot of these things uh that we're talking about right now where it's very visual thematic um how um how's that work for you uh does do you find inspiration from the visual aspect so is the music come first is there some sort of concept that originates something like the next billion years yeah it's a good question i mean i kind of I tend to think uh, very visually when I when I write music. So I always have like a like imaginary film scene in my head or whatever, you know. It's like um like a mood, you know, we talked about stranger things or or dark how they create an atmosphere. That's what I connect with. I connect with atmospheres and and, and like moods and I have all these images in my head when I write music. You know, it can be like literally me sitting down on the piano playing a few chords and I'm in the world right away, you know, just like mm. by what these chords mean to me or what they, what images they bring up, you know, and, and then I approach it like that. I kind of score like an imaginary scene, um, not even like conceptualizing it like that, but, but I like to have images in my, in my head around music and, and, and that informs where the idea wants to go too, you know, because then I'm in the forest at the middle of the night and it's, scary but it's also beautiful and that kind of is a mood right there you know and then mm -hmm. i know what the music wants and where i want it to go um but sometimes there's also like very precise um inspirations that uh inform a concept you know with the next billion years it was like a lucky find i found this tape in a secondhand store in los angeles which just said uh, cousteau handwritten on the tape um, and i you know I, I like to resample a lot of my synthesizers and stuff on, on, on tapes because I like that wobbly kind of boards of Canada sound. So I bought like a lot of old tapes, preferably ones that have been dubbed over many times, <laughs> you know, and one of them uh, said Cousteau. And what I found out when I played the tape back, um, back home in the studio was that there was a speech by uh, Jacques Cousteau on there that was previously unknown. Apparently I researched it uh, hard on the internet it was not to be found anywhere else. And on that speech, um, he basically talks about the future of humanity and um, the next billion years. That's one of the things he said. And that inspired like a whole, I mean, that opened the whole door in my head and led me down the rabbit hole of thinking about the future of our species and, you know, the planet, everything, you know, especially where we are now with like, climate change and all the mm. crazy things happening uh, to our planet. And that sort of, you know, formulated a concept around the long-term future of our species, 
which I wanted to um, write a soundtrack for. Essentially, that uh, that's what the album is. It's like a soundtrack to an imaginary movie that deals with the next billion years. I appreciate your optimism for going a billion years into the future because sometimes no. I feel like two months in the future might be too far. <laughs> we might have destroyed I, ourselves yeah, by but, then. <laughs> but you know, it's not necessarily very optimistic because um, it doesn't need to include humans even being in the picture. You know what I mean? Yeah, right. Um, I mean, that's one of the things he talks about. Like there's other intelligent species that might emerge after humans are long gone that will populate this planet. You know, like how we are descendants of the apes, apparently, you know, like maybe there's descendants of raccoons or like crows or whatever that mm. a billion years from now look very different than, you know, we're very different from apes in a way, you know, we're like still like resemble them a little bit. But if you just like imagine that a little bit, you could imagine other creatures or dolphins. There's so many whales, so many intelligent creatures that give them enough time and that evolution do its thing might be a new um, highly developed intelligent species uh, on this planet mm. and and that's also fascinating to me you know my my sci-fi kid comes out when when i think about these uh, things you know i right. grew up on a lot of fantasy and sci-fi stuff and uh, that always like sparked my imag imagination you know mm -hmm. yeah I, I heard somebody I've, you know, I watch a lot of these documentaries and things about nature and you know the future and all that and they were talking about saving the planet, saving the planet. And they're like, the planet's going to be fine. <laughs> it's yeah, us exactly. that we're, we're the ones that are in danger. And the planet will rebound. You know, it will might go through a little period of difficulty while it cleans up after us. But, um, you know, it'll be fine and something else will happen and that'll be mm -hmm. the end of it. So it's interesting that you put it that way. Because yeah, to me, that was that very sobering. Really... It was, we, sobering, we put so much importance also... on ourselves. Yeah, but it's it's a really good point you're making because it's really us that we need to quote unquote save. You know, it's mm -hmm. not so much uh, because people are always like slow to adopt and uh, change their behavior, and it's like all oh, the planet and stuff. But it's really them. You know, it's like their children, their grandchildren, and you know whatever comes after that. Um, but people do really think about next week more than than they think about the future of their kids mm -hmm. or their kids. You know, it's like uh, we're like a very self serving species i mean not all of us but uh, a lot of us are just very concerned with ourselves and like the immediate future you know so i just enjoy like the the broader look and just even to stoke a sense of awareness in people by writing a record around the next billion years that's a little bit like whoa that's like a long uh time frame you're looking at there you know but mm. i just want to encourage people to think about more than themselves you know and just outside of their um comfort zone a little bit you know yeah and you make a great point in the kind of like intro video you have on youtube talking about the future long-term future of the species but you also say but it's grounded in now and really the fate of our long-term situation really depends mm -hmm. on what we do now there's yeah there's short-term behavior that needs to happen for our long-term visions exactly yeah that's mm -hmm. very true I was wondering because uh, I, I imagine you're you're fairly well trained musically with in theory. Um, you're directing orchestras. No, really. Oh no, no, okay. not at all. Man. So <laughs> I'm, I don't come from a very musical family at all. You know, I mean, my mom, um, she had us go through piano lessons as like small kids, like five, six years old. But we had to learn like Christmas carols, and me and my sister hated it. We we were like really bad students. My um, piano teacher at some point talked to my mom and she was like, you're wasting your money. Oh, no. <laughs> you know, do you really <laughs> want to see this through? Um, but it wasn't until I started playing the drums that I really found like a passion in music. And later on, I returned to the piano and I'm glad my mom forced me to get like the basic lessons because then um, my basic knowledge about harmonies and chords and stuff made me eventually sit back down at the piano and learn music that wasn't just like Christmas carols or whatever, you know, and and, and learn other people's music that I, I liked and stuff. But I had never, you know, I, I don't come from, from like a formal musical education at all, you know. Mm -hmm. So that's actually a, a big um, challenge to me um, sometimes because when I write for orchestra, for example, um, I need to do it a different way. I can't just like write sheet music, you know. Mm -hmm. 
but you know there's a great team of people I work with like orchestrators and people that translate whatever I write in MIDI um, to be able you know to be deciphered by musicians uh, in terms of sheet music so there, there are ways you know I don't think you need to necessarily be a trained formally educated um, composer to be able to compose music for picture hmm. oh that's cool yeah so you had me fooled <laughs> It's, I hear that a lot, though, with people where the uh, kind of, you know, it's school, right? Like, I'm a school teacher myself, and a lot of times yeah. schooling ruins learning for kids. Like, I have students that say they hate learning, and I'm like, no, mm -hmm. you don't hate learning. Like, no one hates learning. You hate how you're being taught, or you hate the way you're yeah. learning, or what you're learning. But everyone loves learning things they're interested in. I think anyway, <laughs> and no, I can remember right. feeling that too. But I think in the case with music too, it can be like that. It be it can be such a passion for a person, but when you're introduced to it in certain manners, it just doesn't click. It's for whatever yeah. reason. I was exposed to that. I think I was in seventh grade, and I had no music at all in my, you know, no understanding of it. And I was in this general music class that I really hated. Two years later, yeah. I was obsessed with the guitar. And it was like, I was this like fruit on a tree waiting to be picked, you know, and to enjoy this like life of music. But the formal way or, or about it, no interest to me. In fact, turned me yeah. off to it. Yeah, I very much res resonate with that. And I think you have to connect with like um, um, passion and enthusiasm, you know. That's mm -hmm. what, what makes learning really exciting. You know, if you're just learning something that you're not excited about, then you're just going to feel like it sucks, you know. But as soon as you have connected with, like, a passion for something, you genuinely want to know more. You want to know how that works. You want to learn how that, you know, can be done. And, and that's how I connect with things. Like, to me, study is play nowadays. And I yeah. laugh about that because I used to hate studying, you know. But I was studying things that didn't interest me. And now I'm just, like, reading things about quantum physics and whatnot. And I wish I had learned uh, in school about these things. And I'm just eating it up. And it's, like, it's fun to me. It's like literally play yeah. to um, educate myself around topics that um, fascinate me, you know. And yeah. I think we think learning a little bit like that, finding out what kids are actually interested in and opening up, opening up that door to them rather than being like, here's a curriculum, one size fits all, you know, you're going to have to learn about all this stuff that maybe you're not even interested in. And yeah, they might have other talents. So might as well find out what those are and, um, you know, allow them to explore that a little more. Mm. Yeah, expose them to the the passion, I guess. Because mm -hmm. everything, every topic, even if you say you hate chemistry, say you don't like history, whatever it is, music. Yeah. Um, there's someone that loves it. There's someone that loves watching, you know, moss grow on the dirt, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and is fascinated by it. And maybe we need to bring the fascination in first. Because I think when you pay close enough to attention to anything, it, it becomes interesting. Mm -hmm. hmm. That's a good point. Were you intimidated though? Then uh, facing like the orchestra, you know, knowing that probably most of these people are <laughs> well seasoned, well trained musicians. Yeah. Oh my God! So so intimidated. <laughs> um, but you know, it's one step at a time. With Angeles, I previously hadn't worked with any like ensembles or anything. And I was a roommate with a violinist that later on I would also work with a lot. And um, I just played fly on the wall in some of the sessions she was involved in, you know, like even like recording a quartet and stuff. and mm. Just learning by, by seeing how they do it and, and realizing that it's not rocket science and that basically it's around the musical idea. And like any idea that I have in MIDI could be translated into sheet music that they could play you know, I just would need somebody that, or a program that would translate that, you know, in a, in a world that can be read in sheet music. And then, of course, it needs to be written in a way that's um, sensible, too. And that's when the orchestrator comes in and might say what you have written here for the high cello could really be violas uh, instead of high cello, whatever. You know, just like talking about DVC and, and like all that stuff and like articulations that I didn't know about. Um, and I just educated myself around that. So there's a lot of self 
uh, education uh, and, a, and a steep learning curve around again something that I started to be interested in. Mm -hmm. And while I'm still not a um, classically trained person, I think I speak that language a little more now. Um, but I was still massively intimidated working with like a full blown orchestra, you know, mm -hmm. just because yeah, I'm not I don't come from that world and. Um, Starting, starting it, and, and, and you know, em, em, embarking on that journey in, in a way um, made me realize it's it's also something I can do. You know, it's it's again something I need to learn about more. But by doing it, I, I kind of did it. You know, it's it's all about like getting your feet wet and right. getting in there and do it. You know, <laughs> mm -hmm. facing the fear. You know, going into that dark room we spoke up, spoke of in, in the beginning. You know, that's that's part of it. It's like. Definitely something outside of your comfort zone, but you know, once you start getting into it, you realize that you bring a lot of resources. You know, just like with your creativity and with your, um, uh, yeah, potential that that's latent. You know, again, like yeah. thinking about quantum um, mechanics and all that. You know, it's, everything is latent in the field, like in the quantum field. You know, it's just a matter of tapping into it and, and manifesting these latent potentials, and, and that's what. That was to me, you know, it's something that I learned I could do. I was just not aware that I could beforehand, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I bet as a newcomer, beginner type of person in that field, you probably have perspectives that, you know, they're not used to seeing. I, For instance, I, I just, this, you know, I have my phone playing music on shuffle as I drive around. I heard this song <laughs> I made on my OP1 when I first got it. And nice. I was like, wow, this is really weird and crazy, but I don't think I could make that song now because I know what I'm doing on it more. <laughs> but yeah. when I first got it, I didn't know what I was doing. I was making these weird sounds and playing with samples in ways like I kind of know better now. But it's cool at the same time. And it kind of just like threw me for a loop where I was, uh, hey, you know, um, sometimes when you don't know what you're doing, cool things happen. Oh yeah, that's such a good point. I mean, it's so true for me as well, like ap approaching everything as much as I can with a beginner's mind. You know, like there's a lot of things that I do do for the first time with an orchestra. At some point, it was the first time for me, but also even things that I do a lot, like working with analog synths and stuff. I like to approach things with a beginner's mind because I'm a big fan of happy accidents and, and things that aren't meant to happen you know because if you conceptualize it too much you like go about your routines you just do them the way you do them but when i get a new piece of gear for example i never read the manual you know i never like watch a youtube tutorial on how this thing works i literally like start exploring it you know and then i might do things the incorrect way in the beginning but i get a bunch of cool sounds out of it you know and then eventually i learn things and then eventually i will watch a tutorial or whatever to know um, better how I can like, get to a specific idea faster. But that beginner's mind is really fruitful and it's um, something that I really enjoy. I think happy accidents are a big part of my music and uh, experimentation in general, you know, just like not really knowing what you're doing and sort of just following the path as it unfolds in front of you, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's pretty neat. It just, I, I got to tell you, like listening to it, I got the feeling like you were not a beginner, <laughs> you know, and that you had all that classical training and understanding of that. And I felt, I just kind of assumed like before anyone could get in front of an orchestra like that, you sort of, you have to be there. But it's, it's cool that, I, you know, I admire that you did it. You just went for it, you know, and figured it out as you went and yeah you were, you were brave in that way it's pretty cool it's yeah maybe brave but also i mean in, in a way everything was written in a different way and i just reimagined it you know when you work with an orchestra like, like let's say i have like an arpeggio playing with a synthesizer that i brought with one of my you know whatever it was like a juno or whatever and then just to imagine that thing to be played by an orchestra um it's really fun, you know, and sometimes you do it wrong and then you propose something that's maybe wrong, but then they think that's cool mm -hmm. because you're like, you're telling the wind, the woodwinds, like the flutes and everything to, to have a, a, a shot at that. You know what I mean? And uh, yeah. of course it needs to be scored out and I talked to my orchestrator about it and, and then we get creative around it. And one of the instruments I discovered that I thought was super cool was the bass flute. 
um, that I really embraced um, on that record. And, and it's just things like that where you like discover this. It's almost like a, like a toolkit or a color palette, you know what I mean? Mm. That you get to draw with for the first time. And you don't really know what you got there until you're like starting to paint with it, you know? And for me, like working with flutes and, and, and the bass flute is specifically, once I knew what that was, I went back to the studio and had like a ton of recordings. And then I reimagined that again, because I was like, no, this is so cool. We're not going to do what I was planning to do here. I'm just going to mute everything else and just isolate that bass flute, compress the hell out of it. So you can he really hear that person playing it and hear her breath. And you hear all these mechanics of the instrument. And I just run with that. You know what I mean? And I didn't know that this, that was something I wanted to do until I recorded it. You know, so that's another maybe unusual way to approaching working with um, classically trained musicians or an orchestra. It's like, usually you would say, you write it, then it's in sheet music and you record it and then it's done. For me, it was like, I wrote it and I wrote it in, in MIDI. Then it is translated into sheet music. Then that's recorded, and then I take the recordings back and like turn them upside down again, you know. So it's nothing what's on the on the sheet music anymore. So if I wanted to play that live, everything would need to be reorchestrated because what ended up being my record is not what ended up being on the sheets. Hmm. So it's interesting how it goes through all these iterations and all these evolutionary steps in a way. But that's just how I work, you know. And maybe that's very unconventional in a way, and it's maybe counterintuitive and maybe idiosyncratic too, but um, it yields some interesting results and that's all I'm interested in. Hmm. Yeah, it's kind of an inside out approach because you know, synthesizers, especially in the early days, they were kind of trying to like mimic orchestral instruments, like this is a brass sound, this is a flute sound. Yeah, yeah. And now you're, <laughs> you're trying to get the instrument to mimic the synthesized sound that you're coming up with on the Juno, like you said. Very cool. Yeah, but then taking them yet again somewhere else completely, you mm. know. Um, because my orchestrations, they were, I, I mean, I really hit the studio with the sense of um, panic because I was like, we have four days to record this whole album. And I know a lot of these songs are not going to stay the way they are. So how can I make sure every all the parts get recorded? But at the same time, inspired musicians to also be open to improvisation, which is a terrible thing for a classically trained musician because they just feel very secure reading sheet music and they're like, I'm playing exactly what's written here, you know? Yeah. And so it was a bit of a dance between, yes, I want you to play what, exactly what's written here. and But once we have that recorded, I also want you to do something completely different and mm -hmm. just something that I tell you to do on the spot and they looked at me like a deer in the headlights you know it's not something they were educated to do but that's kind of what i requested them to do so mm. it was interesting you know getting the street music recorded and then getting improvs recorded as well and then superimposing these two on top of each other mm. uh it was interesting <laughs> mm. yeah well now that you mention it and thinking to like some of the sounds on the record i i did get the feeling it had a very synthesizer sound in a lot of ways even though there's a lot of uh you know orchestral instruments but I, I think it's really cool how you did things that are very unconventional in that situation if you're recording an orchestra you're trying to get like the sound of the orchestra and then there's a, like a proper way to do it but mm -hmm. here you are over compressing things so you're bringing out even some of the characteristics of the instrument that you normally try to keep out the the yeah, mechanisms exactly. the breath <laughs> But those are yeah. those are very human. Those are that's there's something there doing it, and that comes through in the music, and it gives it that kind of like organic, lifelike, you know, it's a living thing now. Mm, I'm I'm glad you're picking up on that because I'm so um, big on all these details, and I mean that's that's what working with an orchestra. It's a living organism, you know, consisting mm. of all these different breathing. Uh, human beings that clearly are masters of the instruments, but ultimately it's like an organism that, you know, ebbs and flows and, and has dynamic and all that. And that's what I found very fascinating, you know, and that's something you would never get out of a library. You can, of course, like, and I used a lot of great libraries to to, to write what I was going to re-record with the orchestra, but then I, like I just illustrated, found myself doing something else completely. Um 
And yeah, I mean, that's like zooming in into the details and the textures is something that I do with recording a synth on tape and then, you know, like really extracting that unsteadiness of the pitch mm. because of the wobbliness of the tape, you know, um, and then really embracing that sound. And the same, same way I embrace um, the human organism that is an or orchestra and, and yeah, the breathing and all that, that's magnified sort of in, in my mm. recording. So I'm not going for the room sound, the big sweeping room sound so much that you hear in like big film scores where, you know, the, the, the air is moved by the whole of the orchestra and it's bouncing off the walls of like air studios or whatever, you know, mm. which sounds amazing. And I mean, I'm sure I'll do that at some point in my life, but we'll, for this specific recordings, I kind of wanted to um, zoom into the details more and, and go macro rather than, uh, oh no, sorry, go micro rather than macro, you know. Mm. But that brings you to that kind of theme too, right? The next billion years where it's going to be a makeup of these like tiny organisms coming together. What are the, the billion years will be the result of whatever they decide to do. Right, yeah. It's this whole dance between um, diving into the details, but also the big picture, you know, and, and that's what we talked about earlier about being in the moment versus being um, on the lookout for the for the long term vision. I like to go back and forth. It's almost like a camera where you like go from macro to micro lens. Mm -hmm. So you're looking at something that's very acute and very like minute and right there in front of you. And it's this is like the present moment to me. It's just like everything else is blurry. You don't know what's back there. You're just zooming in into that plant and you're just going into the micro lens, you know. But then also, again, you need to have the big vision for for like the long, long-term future. And then you just make the foreground blurry and get like the <laughs> the horizon uh, in, mm. in focus, you know. So that's that's kind of the interplay that, that I see happening on that record or in general that I enjoy. Just being in the present and then also out there way in the future, you know. <laughs> <laughs> That is way. That makes any sense. <laughs> it really does, and I think even the art you have for the album, it seems like it's these like almost like microscopic pictures, maybe, or they could also be like galaxies. Like you kind of can't tell if you're looking at a picture of space or something in a microscope. Yeah, that's the intention exactly. I mean, it's this hermetic principle of as below, uh, as above, so below, where you just realize. Um, if you zoom into your iris of your eye, it re resembles a nebula in space or something, you know, mm. and you have all these um, correspondences of like a turtle shell looking like cymatics, um, you know, of, of, of like sound resonances. And uh, I'm just a big fan of that because that's how nature operates, you know, and if you can encapsulate that in art and kind of capture that, um, then that's beautiful. And I think people connect to it because they're, we are part of nature and it just seems very real to us. And there's something beyond like a intellectual um, concept that we seem to connect with there. And that's just kind of what I'm chasing in, in my music, you know, just like mm. the, the natural laws and, and making them visible or audible in, in art, essentially, you know. Mm -hmm. Well, you mentioned a, it's a question I want to ask you about was um, something you said at the end of that video as well. Um, you're interested in uh, the healing modalities through sound and visuals and exploring yeah. that further. Totally. So what does that mean? I know it sounds kind of <laughs> vague, but that's because I'm at the, you know, at the beginning of it. Um, to me, it's fascinating what music does to the human body. Um, just if you think about like the parasympathetic and the sympathetic nervous system and how you can trigger a parasympathetic nervous response through music, um, you know, parasympathetic being rest and digest and then sympathetic being fight or flight. And in our society, in our lives, we're not in fight or flight mode, even though we don't need to be, but just because we're like so on the go all the time, the nervous system and the body doesn't get to be in homeostasis, which is rest and digest, you know. Mm. And I think it's fascinating how music can prompt you to get that nervous system response and like really heal like literally be in homeostasis where the body restores and that can be induced just by frequency and i think that's fascinating to begin with um and then how binaural beats work you know like how one ear hears a frequency at 105 hertz and the other ear hears 100 hertz and then your brain sort of 
because that doesn't happen in nature. You know, if you clap your hands, you hear that in stereo. You never in, in nature hear a sound being 100 hertz on the left ear and 105 hertz on the right ear. Mm. But if you do that on headphones, and that's how binaural beats work, your brain is sort of uh, forced to um, uh, be in a coherence because the left hemisphere of the brain and the right hemisphere of the brain make up for that difference. They're like, oh, that's weird. I'm hearing this on the left ear. I'm hearing that on the right ear. And it creates this other, um, this other beat, this other tone, which encompasses both hemisphere of, of the brain. And that's when coherence happens in the brain. You know, like a lot of the uh, mental problems we have are basically based on um, uncoherence. You know, like left and right brain hemispheres not um, communicating properly. You know, and um, again, that's something that you can do with sound highly fascinating with, uh, to me. And then if I just think that further, how can you, um, if you know that that's true and that's scientifically proven, how can you incorporate that into like an artistic approach into like compositions? You know what I mean? Mm. So your compositions are artful and like artistic, but they also include um, knowledge about how sound affects your body in a very healing and, and positive way. And that's just fascinating to me. Um, sorry, that was a long answer to a short question, but I think it requires um, I, a long answer, though. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and then the same is true with visuals too, you know. And that's why I'm like so into audiovisual experiences. I don't think as my live shows as live shows anymore. I think of them as audiovisual experiences that need to be immersive and trigger all these nervous system responses in the human body. Mm. Um, that's just something again that I'm fascinated by, and I love to learn more about it. And I learned more about it by doing it, essentially. You know, I did this whole thing for Planetariums, which was my album a couple of years ago called Sphere, where I wrote something for Planetariums. And we toured the show in Planetariums worldwide. It was a, a big success, actually. It was won a couple of awards, like Best Immersive Experience and everything. And we played it in Planetariums from Moscow to, uh, to San Francisco. It was just cool to do something outside of, like, club or concert stages or festival stages mm -hmm. but just embracing that medium planetarium which has like the dome you know like 360 visuals mm -hmm. um highly sophisticated surround sound systems and writing music for that mixing it in third order episonics and having all these visuals that needed um to render for a week like one minute of the visuals need to needed to render for one week because oh it needed God. to be 8k resolution wow it's just mind-boggling <laughs> you know and um these things fascinate me. And again, I keep repeating myself, but that's that's kind of a rabbit hole I'm in. You know, audiovisual, pushing the boundary of what's possible in, in technology also. Mm. Uh, also mixing my albums in, yeah, basically in Dolby Stereo or in Third Order Ambisonics and all these new formats that allow you to be really in the music than just like uh, having a stereo, um, you know, two-speaker kind of experience. So that's all interesting to me. Yeah, there's no doubt. I mean, even if you just take it on the level of like, you know, you can listen to music to get pumped up or or to soothe yourself when you're sad. The, the effect it has on us is pretty incredible. But then when you start thinking about like the brain waves and the binaural beat stuff, it, there's there's a lot to be explored there. And it's... Um, I agree. It's pretty interesting. And I think it's early days, you know. I think yeah. we, we just have the... Um, tip of the iceberg of what that really is and I'm just like waiting for science to make more discoveries because um, I'm very much I mean I'm also very interested in this whole field where spirituality and um, science meet you know where sort of quantum physics confirms things that let's say Buddhism said two and a half thousand years ago you know around oneness and all that you mm -hmm. know and now we have like research on quantum entanglement and the idea that we're all made of out of energy and at the Big Bang, this energy was dispersed into the universe and we're all part of that. Like all these particles, these energetic expressions are in us and we are it, you know what I mean? Yeah. So it just like brings this whole like sort of lofty, like kind of hippie-ish idea of like, oh, we're all one man <laughs> to like a like rock bottom, like solid science-y um, basis you know which which i think is fascinating and, and then how music plays into all that and there's a lot to be discovered still i think we're just at the, at the beginning
Yeah, and it's fascinating that they had so much of that figured out so long ago. It's like, how did yeah. they know that? And it's like, wow, no, yeah, but it, we really are know, like, one now. <laughs> I know, but like to me, it's crazy to think that it took Newton or like any scientist to formulate whatever law around nature for it to be accepted. You know, I think gravity was clearly working on all of us um, before it was a mathematically defined law. You know what I mean? Mm, right. So that's what I'm saying always. Like magic to me is just science that we don't understand yet. You know. Mm -hmm. At some point, gravity was working on this planet and nobody had like grasp on it, but it was still a thing. Mm -hmm. And I think similarly, things are happening now that we don't understand scientifically yet, yet they're very much real. You know what I mean? Yeah. We just put it into the magic or like, um, yeah. you know, like pseudo, pseudo, pseudo science department just because <laughs> science hasn't caught up with it yet. But I'm like, yeah, it's just a matter of time, you know. Well, it's really awesome that you're thinking about this and exploring it with your music. Where do you like to send people? I know we want to get you off for your next uh, obligation here, so maybe we oh, can. Oh, thank uh, you for being mindful of the time. I totally forgot. When yeah, you, I, I know. When, I had a when, feeling when we were going to off on that subject. I can go. For I, hours, I'm ready so. to get on the ride with you too, but I want to be respectful yeah. of your time. <laughs> Absolutely. Thanks so much. So where uh, do you like so to send people to find out about more of your work? And uh, obviously, the next billion years. Um, can be streamed wherever you stream music. It can be found all yeah. over the place there. Well, I, I would say my latest release is always where you should connect with me because I have a, a pretty deep um, catalog. been making music for, I don't know, uh, a long time. I don't even count anymore. <laughs> so um, if you discover it in shuffle mode, you might find something from like 10 years ago. And that's still valid. You know, that's something that was very valid then. But if you want to know what I'm up to these days, I would say just like my latest release is always where it's at. Mm -hmm. So it's the next billion years at the moment and it will be something else soon because I'm always working on new music. So yeah, um, I'm always happy when people find my music. And it's also interesting how timelines are kind of parallel. You know, we, we talked about sync placements in the beginning. Um, people find my music like a song that I wrote 10 years ago in a show that comes out today. Mm. And I think that's beautiful too, you know, because yeah. we talked about Kate Bush, 1985, and now that's a big song for her. Um, so I have a lot of faith in like people finding my music when they need to, need to sort of find it and hear it. Um, and, and music is timeless like that. So as much as I say, listen to my latest stuff, I also say, you know, whatever you find, it doesn't matter from when I made it. It found you now, so there must be a reason. <laughs> right. <laughs> and maybe we don't have a scientific name for that reason, but... Nope, nope. <laughs> <laughs> doesn't mean it's not there affecting us. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, thanks so much for taking the time to talk to us. I'll put all this stuff in the show notes, too. I'll make it easy for everybody so they can find it there. But I love your work. I'm really happy that we got a chance to discuss it. And, you know, I'd love to catch up with you some other time in the future. Beautiful. Whatever you have to Thank next. you so much for having me, man. Appreciate it. 